Good afternoon and thank you for attending my presentation today on the usefulness of high performance computing and small scale hydropower technology. So my name is Chantal Niebuhr and I'm from the University of Pretoria. Uh, I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Civil Engineering and you'll see some of my co-authors listed here for the presentation because of their relevance in the study. So Mr. Mark van Dijk has sort of been our leader in hydrokinetic energy and just hydropower in general, um, who started this whole you know, research aspect at UP, which we've gotten quite deep into. And then also Christian de Vett, who's from Aerotherm and has really, really been a big help on the CFD side of, of the study, which is also relevant to today's lecture, or today's, lecture, today's presentation. So uh, I'm just gonna give you a short introduction on the study or some background to the study. And then I'm going to focus more on just the CFD um, and specifically through our validation cases, which became a really big part of our study and actually a big focus on just, you know, finding the best route on modeling these wakes um, and, and just hydrokinetic turbines in general. Um, then I'm going to just give you a, a quick look into our current work and why we are doing this, you know, uh, the study in CFD, and then just some conclusions and comments on the computing overview. So just to give you an introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with hydrokinetic energy, it is basically like a wind turbine underwater that can then be placed in a channel flow or river flow and it utilizes the kinetic energy of flowing water to then produce energy locally. So uh, they're typically small devices and you would place these in array systems to produce however much energy you need um, at a point. So you just need a high enough velocity um, and then produce your energy locally. So we actually installed the first modern hydrokinetic device um, in the Khrubuswip area in the Northern Cape. Uh, and this was part of a Water Research Commission funded, um, or Department of Science and Technology through the Water Research Commission funded project, uh, where we actually, this was more of a field study um, and how we got into hydrokinetic energy because this was the main water source and we couldn't use any traditional forms of hydropower. And then we started looking at, you know, after, during our final design, we started looking at where is this relevant, and we found that there are, is a great deal of canal infrastructure in South Africa, and um, more than 6,000 kilometers of canals with a lot of drop structures and other structures, weirs, and anything that you can use to actually, you know, install some hydropower, um, and also then specifically hydrokinetic energy. So we started researching more in this, actually even developing our own turbine, which was optimized to um, typical uh, canal systems in South Africa, um, sticking to canals rather than river systems. And uh, we also then, on the undergraduate side, you know, had students start looking at what they would find, find to be the best solutions um, and playing around with, you know, optimizing solutions for canal infrastructure, looking at different mechanisms specifically for low flow velocity options. So we tried to build like our own little niche of, of hydropower and start advancing in this field at UP. Um, and it also allowed us to get a good idea of the implementation procedure. So we also published a paper on this um, because you, you need a good understanding of what it takes to install one of these turbines, um, what your procedure is, what your legislative and regulatory procedure is, um, what your investment cost is, and you need operational data. So this is what we initially looked at. But then, um, we started realizing that the site investigation is not enough. And in order to understand more on the actual installation side and you know what, what happens below the, the border surface, we need to do some numerical models. Um, and CFD or computational fluid dynamics modeling was the only way or the best way to, to get a good idea of this. So those two coupled together gave what I call efficient development or gave us a better idea of efficient development, meaning um, specifically, how can we allow better installations and optimize our installations um, so just efficiently develop hydrokinetic energy in South Africa? So that was the development of the study and what we primarily use CFD for. And that is, if I can simplify to looking at um, the or understanding the and quantifying the wake behavior and backwater effect of hydrokinetic turbines placed in channel flow. So basically, how far does the wake extend downstream and how much backwater effect do we have? And that is what we then call hydrodynamic effects that we're investigating. So the study is basically consolidation, or we started off by consolidating all relevant literature, like any 
research study and then using CFD and experimental results to fill where we found knowledge gaps and where we need to add knowledge to sort of develop final guidelines um, and possibly wake and damming models for South African canals to just make life easier for the installer and you know not have to do an expensive CFD model every time you need to do an installation. And obviously today's presentation will focus more on the use of CFD um, the work that we've done and, and just some a small small sample of the findings that we've had so far. So to to focus more on the CFD, we we first needed to develop proper model validation cases. So um, we needed to make sure that our numerical models were accurately showing the wake behavior um, or even the, just the turbine behavior in flow so that we could play around with these models and you know, get a good idea of exactly what we're dealing with. So we used um, two validation cases specifically, the first being the reference model one turbine, which was um, in the model in the Sandia laboratories in the USA. So we're working with those researchers um, and basically using that as our primary validation case. And then we also have multiple other, um, such as this MASIC turbine, which I've highlighted because I'm going to show you some results today, um, and additional to some other results that we found in literature to try and revalidate our validation case and see that our conclusions on one case actually are applicable to multiple other operational scenarios. So focusing on our model validation of the reference model one turbine, um, we basically did our benchmark validation um, by validating the model through performance and wake metrics. So we didn't want to only focus on performance because a lot of uh, researchers and literature did that and we found that you don't necessarily get accurate wake results by just validating your performance because there are a lot of complex driving factors dissipating these vortex structures in the wake that don't necessarily um, correlate well to just predicting performance well. Um, so our CFD modeling approach was we were using Star, um, Siemens Star CCM Plus and hence the, the great help from Aerotherm as well. So amazing software that we're utilizing and that we get to utilize there. Um, we did steady and transient models. So we played around with different approaches, rotor modeling approaches. Um, we did also single phase and multi-phase models to try and see what the effect is if you model one or the other. So we tried to get the most simplified form of a semi-accurate or, or good digital twin. And then um, most importantly, we were comparing RANS models, so Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes um, turbulence models. We were not, we did not want to go into LES and DES models. We actually wanted to keep it simple and, well, as, <laughs> if I can call RANS simple, um, but just try and stick to these lower fidelity models um, and try and get, you know, a, a good working model from, from one of these approaches. So this is sort of a summary of our approach that we built based on what we found in literature to be the best approach. And um, there wasn't a lot on this, but these were some of the approaches people used and different validation cases that we found. And we consolidated this and then tested different aspects, mixed these together. So you use some different approaches with rotor modeling um, techniques, um, different turbulence models, and obviously different time solutions. And then found what works best for us. So there were some, like initially we started with a full rotor geometry and RANS models. Um, which then you know didn't work. We then moved on to virtual disk models and tried a higher fidelity Reynolds stress models. Um, also finding that steady state didn't work. Moved on to transient, etc. So our model validation was done in two ways. We first did our torque and thrust validation. So um, just comparing uh, the experimental torque and thrust values to and power coefficients to our CFD models, and both or pretty much all the approaches actually work quite well um, within the torque and thrust, so the performance metrics. But what was more important on our side is actually modeling downstream weight correctly. So this graph that you see on the bottom is one you'll see a lot throughout the presentation. And what we did here primarily is to plot the velocity deficit, so basically the weight recovery rate, um, as you look downstream, so x over d was just the diameters downstream on the x-axis, and then we compared different um, approaches and different you know, turbulence models to try and see what works best. And um, first, like I said, we started off with a full rotor geometry. So we actually used um, the full rotor geometry modeling a rotating mesh around the blades and, um, and coupled this with a few turbulence models. 
So it was quite a large mesh. So our, through our grid independent study, we found that around about a 15 million cell mesh with a smaller cell, 3.5 millimeters worked best here. Um, and it, although it showed very, very good results for performance, so here you can just see the tip speed ratio um, variation and torque variation, how well the experimental results actually correlated with CFD. Um, but on the <clears throat> wake side, we had a few struggles where, um, especially on the full rotor geometry, you just had very strong vortex structures um, from the full rotor geometry that then sort of didn't dissipate well enough in the wake because of the over um, dissipation of turbulence in the um, within the RANS models. So that was a bit of a problem. And because of that, we found that some or a solution, a possible solution to this was using the bay element momentum uh, method or, uh, theory on a virtual disk. So instead of actually mo modeling the blades, we just use virtual disk um, and then use the lift and drag coefficients. So we actually used uh, numerically generated lift and drag coefficients, which worked better than some um, experimental results that we found. And and so those were actually on XFOIL. And we actually ended up using this coupled with Reynolds stress model, um, which gave us around about a, a mesh of 13 million cells, so slightly smaller. Um, so we had quicker solving times. And it just correlated really well to our experimental results. So you'll see the little squares that you have there were from the right um, rotor, so not the left. The right rotor did have some issues with the experimental setup, which you always have to consider with your validation because uh, there was some asymmetry in the approach flow. So there were some issues there. So we depended more on the left rotor. And this correlated really well to our transient um, BM CFD method. And I mean, this was a long procedure that I'm not explaining now, but we sort of found that because you have these strong um, vortices or over strong vortices from the full rotor geometry, the BM sort of counteracts that, which works well with the um, sort of under dissipation of the, the vortices in the, in the wake. So the limitations of both somehow together worked well, which was sort of a lucky in between. Um, and you can see an example of this where on the bottom picture over there, you have the full rotor geometry mesh and the strong vortices that just aren't breaking up fast enough. And in the top, you can see the BM uh, method, which, which did work better. So uh, that was a really interesting find. And it was, uh, I mean, we, we did a lot of studies on that. And we also looked at multi-phase. So we did, we actually modeled, instead of using a symmetry plane, we modeled the air-water interface, found good correlation to experimental results there as well. Um, we had some issues specifically on the inlet because we had a poly mesh, um, which needed to be used because of that complex rotating wake. Um, but then, you know, you want a structured mesh for a VOF um, or a, a free surface, which caused some issues with waves forming. And we had a lot of issues with convergence here. Um, but eventually we did find, you know, we got a good solution for this and actually compared it to our symmetry plane, but still found that the best, simplest approach, you know, symmetry plane worked well and there was no need to go into uh, a much larger mesh using a VOF approach. So uh, this was just some of the studies that we did and we got to sort of a best case uh, of modeling these the hydrokinetic turbines. And then obviously we can't just say our recipe works for all, so we had to do some further validation. And what we did here is we tried to model it like we would if we didn't have a validation case. So model it using our recipe and, and see if we get good correlation. And we actually did, which was really, really great for us. Um, without playing around with the model too much and trying to adapt the two experimental results, we got really good correlation. Uh, although you can see between 1D and 3D, so one diameter and three diameter downstream, we had a few discrepancies. But then as you do, we compared it to experimental and knowing how difficult it is to get those probe measurements behind the hub, um, we found that, in, I mean, in a numerical case, you get to look at exactly that cell, what value you have there. And just changing that slightly to the left or the right, which would automatically happen experimentally, gave us a big variation. So um, we're not blaming our model for that. <laughs> But yes, if you even just look at the average cylinder velocity, so just taking um, the diameter, the area of the turbine downstream and averaging the velocity, we compared that to experimental values and still got good correlation. 
specifically for higher turbulence intensities. So it's always complicated to try and get the RANS models to perform well at higher turbulence intensities. So we didn't use ambient um, turbulence intensity terms here. We used uh, inflow turbulence intensities specified and actually got very good correlation, which was good news for us. Um, so not a, map, or not a big differential there and, and good for our study. So what we're using this work for is basically to try and identify what we call wake metrics. So testing different variables um, and sort of uh, trying to get an idea of what governs the wake formation. So for instance, we're testing tip speed ratios and um, seeing what effect that has on the wake. Um, for instance, in the near wake and the far wake. Also inlet velocities, so seeing if we have faster recoveries for what aspects and just understanding what operational conditions, for instance, if you have different inlet turbulences, what governs wake formation and what changes wake formation. So in conclusion, um, there were some CFD challenges, obviously, specifically in this work. It is very complex and um, we had some far wake model challenges, so with stability in the far wake and accuracy in the far wake. So um, it, it is a challenge to get that right, specifically with the Reynolds stress models. Uh, but it was, it was really great to, to actually get there. Um, and also boundary wake interaction. So to, to make sure that you're modeling that correctly and getting a good correlation to experimental results. Um, and also modeling that free surface as accurately as possible. So through the symmetry plane testing that you are actually you know, replicating um, what would happen in real life and not just specifying something. Um, and assuming it's correct. And obviously what has to be mentioned is the large computational requirements. So, uh, and the reason that, that I'm presenting here today is obviously because we needed the CHPC for this um, and it wouldn't be possible without the, the, computational or the computational resources that we have available to us through them. So um, one of the important issues worth mentioning is the scaling issues. So we found specifically with sliding mesh, um, it didn't scale very well, and it's important to always check this and test this to make sure we're not wasting resources, um, specifically on these complex CFD um, flows. You know, you can get scaling issues, and it's important to consider them. Um, and obviously the complexity of the turbulent wake, so understanding the behavior and the driving factors and making sure that you consider that um, and not just sort of, um, you know, do, run the model, do it, and Think that your results are, are correct. So I like showing this picture. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, but um, it's very relevant. I always feel it's very relevant to our study because although a wake seems like a simple um, mechanism, it's still, you know, we're breaking it up and trying to understand the driving factors in a different way, um, which does save us a lot of time rather than going into depth into um, the turbulence and, 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 you know, untapping exactly what the driving factors are. Um, so it's giving us a good, quick solution to, you know, specifying to in, or installers or um, any developers in the future how to or what to predict um, from these turbines. So um, we're obviously continuing research in this field. Uh, we're doing a lot on the installation side, which obviously I haven't mentioned today. So new area, we're trying to find new areas of application um, and trying to get long-term operational data um, because you need that to, for feasibility studies and to actually make sure that this can operate long term. Um, and obviously also on the legislative and regulatory side, they need operational data and they need sort of success stories um, to try and make this an easier um, process to install. And then on the numerical models, which was part of today's all of today's presentation, um, it's important to you know, use it correctly and to understand the shortcomings when you're using a numerical model and to ensure that you're actually doing um, proper validation. Um, so I think that's a very important point. And we found that to be something that's really, really missed in a lot of publications um, where inaccurate solutions are found because there wasn't proper validation. Um, so just ensure that it is applied and, and valid. Um, and obviously the possibilities through the, the CHPC. So this wouldn't be possible without them. And we, we really, you know, I think we use it. We use a lot of resources, um, but it gives us a really, well, really good results. And, and we've gotten a lot of good um, publications through this. So if you're interested in more um, or you want to read up more on this, you're welcome to look us up on ResearchGate. 
Um, so Chantal Niebuhr, myself, or Mike Van Dijk, we all have the papers on there. You'll see some journal articles. There's also some coming out soon that will be added. And obviously, um, more conference articles on this that you can also have a look at um, if it interests you. But yes, I hope that gave you a good idea of our little people or a little people into our um, work on or our use of high performance computing within the civil industry and also um, within small scale hydropower development. And yeah, so thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it.